Okay. You guys are responsible for making sure that my hearing aid doesn't make noise, okay? Because clearly I can't hear it. <laughs> As the lovely introduction said, I am Jordan, and I was born deaf, disabled, and disfigured. And I could go on all day about any of those, but I only have like 10 minutes, so I'll focus on the one that I think gets the least amount of attention, and that is disfigurement. And my intent here isn't to just talk about my own connections, but really make a connection with each one of you and make us think about those connections because I've always been disfigured and not everyone gets that experience, clearly. So of course I'm gonna start up with a story because what else can I do but tell a story? Back when I was a freshman in high school, I, like most other freshmen, in English class we were learning about Romeo and Juliet and my English teacher, who was very pregnant at the time, took the time to talk about the science of falling in love. And I was sitting in front row because where else could I sit, really? And I had friends on either side of me, which meant we got a front row seat to how she diverted the lesson even farther to talk about how people who are asymmetrical can never be loved, that they grow old and they'll die alone because the science says that you can't fall in love with someone. And that was really interesting to me. And the only thought running through my head was I really hope that her baby doesn't come out like me. Not because I hate my own life, in fact, I'm pretty darn happy with where I am, but because I knew that that kid would not be cherished in a way that they should be. And that was just three minutes of my day. And I have hundreds of stories the same. And I'm not alone, although it felt like that in that classroom, even with my friends on either side. In fact, 10% of the population has a disfigurement of some sort. Two to 3% of that are considered highly visible disfigurements. So like myself with my facial disfigurement, this is post plastic surgery, by the way. Or people with limb differences or amputations, ones who can't really hide as easily. And yet, the other kids, the teachers, they never knew how to interact with me quite properly. And it was really, really important to think about why. Where do we learn about disfigurement? Where do we see people like me? Because it's something that's been happening for centuries. We've been here the whole time. In fact, think about early Christianity when much of the congregation wasn't literate. How did they share the Bible, the stories with people who couldn't read? They illustrated them, right? They put them in the big stained glass with the pretty colors. How did they illustrate evil, sin, the devil. Oftentimes it was with people who looked like me, not like the everyday. And that had left a lasting impact. It made churches not very kind to people like me. And then even in America, in the 1860s, after the Civil War, we had a sudden spike of disfigurement because all the soldiers were coming home. Medicine had improved that we could save their lives, but not really their appearance. And cities responded to that by actually making laws about disfigurement and disability and being in public. Now we call them the ugly laws, where someone like me wouldn't be allowed to be in public for certain hours of the day, or at all even. The last of those laws wasn't struck out of the books until the 1960s in Chicago. People are still alive today who are prosecuted under those laws. And just because the laws were taken off the books doesn't mean the education that put them there are. They were established during the peak of eugenics in this nation, and that impacts education and you know, how we interact with each other and the media. Because when I was a kid, no one knew anyone who looked like me. I didn't know anyone who looked at me. I still haven't met anyone who has the same condition I do to this day. So the other kids got two options. 
which label was I going to be? Was I going to be like that guy in the Goonies who was stupid? Which quite frankly is a insult to everyone with cognitive disabilities as well. But the other option was even more popular and that was, would I be evil? Because so often disfigurement in media means that someone became disfigured through evil or the evilness made them become evil. So think about, let's say, Batman's villains. We have, you know, Two-Face, quite literally in the name. But we also have Darth Vader and Voldemort and every James Bond villain ever. And those things add up because people don't think, they don't know who I am. But in the back of their head, they've internalized, I've seen these people before and they'll always act like that. Which meant a lot of the connections I made when I was little were negative, not positive. And I cherished the relationships I did build as a child that were positive because they looked past my face. They looked past how everyone treated me, the teachers, the adults, people in the street who would pull their kids away from me. And they decided to be my friend anyway. But they were vastly outnumbered. And I don't blame them. They were just modeling the behaviors of the adults around them. But after a point, you have to realize that those kids grow up. I grew up. And looking at the statistics, it didn't get much better because people who are disfigured have a higher unemployment rate and a bigger wage gap than our visually typical peers. And we have higher rates of anxiety and depression, possibly because we also have higher rates of being harassed and even hate crimes, all because of what we look like and how no one thought, no one thinks when they see someone on the street consciously, oh, I don't like those people because they're just like the movie. But when that's the only representation that you get and no one counteracted it when you were little or when you were a teenager and no one corrected the teacher when they say things like people who are symmetrical can't be loved in class, you trust those adults. And what I don't want you to take from this is that this is how it is and this is how it always will be because it's not. Each of us have control over our own actions and our perceptions, which means I really want you to go home, or even right now, and think about how do you make your space welcoming to people who look like me? And it's been a centuries-long battle for us. We have a lot of bad, bad press to combat, which means we can't just be advocating for ourselves all the time. Because like I said, I hadn't ever met anyone who's disfigured like in the way I am. And I'm only here because I'm spiteful and I wanted to prove everyone wrong, that I wasn't one of those two labels. But a lot of other kids don't get that support I had. They don't have the positive relationships I do. So it's really important to me that people see us as people. And let's say that when you're talking about disfigurement or ugly people, making jokes on Twitter, you don't use someone who looks like me to demean someone else. You don't use someone who looks like me as a visual shorthand for more failings. Because those have really hard consequences for people who are just born different or they acquire a disfigurement in a traumatic event or a medical event. And we don't get a say in it, but we do have a say in how we act. Thank you.